Hello, Hokie softball fans, and welcome into another edition of the Hokie Softball Podcast. It is great to have you with us. My name is Evan Hughes, proud host of the Hokie Softball Podcast, and we're pleased to be joined by the head coach of the Hokies, Coach Pete Demore, in his South office today, joining us on the show. Coach, how's the South office, and how are things going for you? It's it's going great, and congratulations to you on your award. I don't think I've talked to you since then, so. Uh... I feel like I'm sitting in here with uh, recording royalty. That's uh, that's John Laser right there. But I appreciate <laughs> that so much, Coach. Really appreciate that. Uh, how are things going in the uh, in the South Office? I know you guys have been busy, of course, being in the indoor facility. Uh, how have things been the last couple of weeks? Pretty good. And practice has started, and uh, we're we're in team practice right now. We're 20-hour weeks, so um, you know it's just good to be back and and getting into somewhat of a rhythm and uh, seeing fresh faces, seeing the returners, just good to have the girls back. So, um, yeah, just no, no complaints so far. Well, on our last Hokie Softball podcast, we talked with Coach Lewis, who was just introduced as one of the assistants. It's been a, a couple of months since we've chatted. So what were the summer months like for you awaiting the team to return? It was just boring, just really boring. Um, I'm sure you'll hit me with this, but my golf game got pretty, uh, pretty I don't want to say stellar, but uh, I was playing pretty well, but there's only so many Zooms and podcasts and all that stuff I could listen to before, you know, I was just out of it. So, uh, you know, it just, I don't like just monotony. And, and it just felt like this summer was just one big same thing every day. I felt like, I feel like, uh, I, I say I felt like Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. Okay? I just woke up and you got that reference? Uh, getting all the Jeopardy questions right every day, right? Yeah, yeah, that and uh, yeah. So it just now there's there's things going on, and uh, you know you can coach and talk to the girls and all that kind of stuff. So it's been uh, it's been a it's been good so far. Well, I'm sure the summer had to feel a little bit weird too, because you know the softball world, your job, a lot of your recruiting gets done over the summer. So I'm sure that had to be weird not going to ballparks every day. Yeah, and I and I think I said this in a previous podcast is probably the first. The first year I can ever remember since I was probably two or three that I that I wasn't at a park. You know, when I was growing up, it was going to my dad's games, and then I'm playing, and then, you know, I play some more, and then, you know, when you recruit, you're out every weekend. It's just, that didn't happen this year. I wasn't at a field at all. So, it's kind of foreign to me, and uh, I didn't like it too much. So, what was it like when you finally end the summer and you get the team back in Blacksburg? What was that moment like for not only just you and your staff, but for the team to come back and see you guys to be reunited again? Yeah, it was. Uh, there was a lot of excitement going on, a lot of anticipation, and uh, the freshmen and the people that live uh, on campus they actually had to wait a week or two to be able to practice uh, with all the tests and stuff they had to do. So, um, for about two weeks, they were just you know, uh, hunkered down in their dorms and um, we let them go on the field and, and practice in groups of two and uh, I would peek my head in and, and see some of them and um, it was just, it was just uh, refreshing to see them. So, uh, but the first practice was, uh, you know, it's always new, every year it's new because it's a new team. And so uh, we try to get, uh, try to get the newbies caught up as, as soon as possible or, or as fast as possible. So. Uh, that's what uh, the emphasis has been so far in, in practice. How different was that first practice in the first couple of weeks, given the fact that the season ended the way it did and players had to go home? Was anything different in the way you prepared for those practices, given the circumstances, or, or not really? No, not at all. It's it just, uh, and you know how we, we operate. Last year's over with. So as far as practice goes, we do the same things we've always been doing. And I shouldn't say the same things. It's just... Uh, you know, the program, we have ways of doing things. And uh, so once they got back, we just uh, full systems go. With the new guidelines and, and restrictions this year, does, does anything change with the amount of practice time that you guys get during the fall season? Or is everything pretty much the same compared to any other year? It's the same. Yeah, we, we started out with uh, our eight hour weeks and now we're in our 20. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like everything else in coaching. You have a plan, and you hope the plan goes as as planned. But uh, you know, we got you know, you don't know when kids are going to be out. So 
So you have to think on the fly and, uh, you know, be able to uh, adjust as adjust as accordingly. One of the changes, no fall ball season uh, this year. It's something that teams across the country are dealing with. Is, is that something that we might see more of you know, inner squads? Is that more practice time? What does that mean, not having those teams coming and playing? The biggest thing for us is how do you keep the players motivated to get better? And in my opinion, the fall games, I mean, they don't matter, you know? So we could play UCLA and Florida in the fall, but it doesn't count for the spring. So it's like, you know, this is the, the biggest challenge right now is how do you motivate players when there's no games going on? That's the thing. So uh, a lot of competitions, a lot of inner squads, um, stat taking, uh, all that stuff, it all matters right now. So it's, uh, it goes, it just plays into our whole philosophy that, you know, you have to be better tomorrow than you were today. So just constant improvement. And even though we're not playing anybody, I mean, the teams that, the inner squads are really, they're really uh, competitive right now. These are so deep. So um, who we, you're playing inner squads as well, that would probably be, be better than the team we would play. And I don't want to, you know, disparage any teams that we play and bring in here, but, um, you know, they're just good competitive games right now. So, um, you know, we're just figuring out new ways to have the, the players compete against each other. You know, we've talked about it on previous podcasts before, but with everybody getting that extra year of eligibility back, it creates a lot of depth. And I'm sure right now, like you said, with these inner squads, it's got to be nice having that amount of depth to set up two teams. Right, right. And, and I like that anyway. Um, to have enough players to be able to, uh, to scrimmage at any time. Um, Cause I'm not, I know class conflicts are gonna come into play. So you wanna have more kids so you can inter squad um, a lot. So, but yeah, it's been a, uh, they've been really good battle so far. And uh, you know, sometimes the pitchers get, get the upper hand and sometimes the hitters get the upper hand, but uh, competition makes you better. So we have that uh, going on all the time here. Well, here's some motivation for uh, players who want to get better. You know, on your Twitter account, we have seen you tweeting about some players going yard. I think you tweeted a couple of weeks ago, Meredith Slaw had the first home run of the year. You stood where uh, Kelsey Bennett uh, hit a home run in practice. So it seems like we've gotten some good updates from your Twitter, and it seems like, Coach, the bats are still hot, uh, picking right where they left off in March. They are. They are. We hit pretty well yesterday. Uh, so... Knock on wood, but um, it, it, I'm not saying our pitching is bad. We just we can hit. So um, yeah, so hopefully it continues. Coach, uh, thinking about this this freshman group that you have coming in, and, and all that they have, so many people have dealt with so much through this year. But you think about that group, and uh, you know having their senior season of high school softball canceled, and prom, and graduation changed. You know, has it been cool to see those kids have a sense of normalcy, doing what they love, playing softball again? Yeah, it's, uh, it has been, it's been neat to see. They just, they have something to do every day. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't imagine my senior year in high school being canceled. Like I look back at my senior year and it was like, uh, some of the stories I can't tell what I did, but uh, <laughs> it's just, just to have it canceled, you know, my senior year baseball, you know, baseball my senior year, it's like, it's an, unfathomable and so these kids got a lot taken away from them and uh just to have them back and uh have some structure and um you know give them some fun it's uh it's a big deal you know for this long time whether it's a freshman class or the returning players or the incoming players they're away from from structure not just softball any other sport when they're at home so are there any uh good stories about players you know trying to to get better in the off season at home i mean i'm sure it was difficult but uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of the dads that coach those kids growing up kind of got to, to get back in as the coach for a couple months and help them stay active. Yeah, I, I, I gave them kind of a outline of what they could be doing on at home. Uh, so, but I'm not a stickler in the summer. So it's like a, a normal normal year. Once they're done in, in May, whatever, I give them the summer off, you know, because our season is long. And this year, we, we only played a third of a season. So uh, I gave them some things to do just to keep in general shape and, um, you know, drills that we do here and uh, different kind of bats and that, that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, they, 
I'm sure there were some dads on a bucket, dusted the bucket off and, uh, you know, <laughs> throwing some balls and uh, all that kind of stuff. But uh, they stayed behind the screen, evidently, because I didn't hear any, uh, no reports of injuries. That's great to hear. No reports of injuries. Maybe some stories will come out here as the players get back. Uh, the we'll see. Arthritis or something. <laughs> Um, you're having a great episode so far. Hope you softball podcast again. We, we're going to talk about the coaching staff here in just a minute. Uh, we've got story time with Uncle Pete still to come. It's great to have Coach Pete tomorrow with us here uh, on the Hope you softball podcast. Uh, one more, uh, one one player I want to highlight real quick. Uh, Kana Davis had a uh, suffered a, a really tough injury before the season started. Uh, I know she's one of the older players now on the team. Uh, is she uh, in, in watching over the summer too? It really seemed like she was rehabbing hard and put some things out on social media. What's her progress been like? And is she back to at least getting back into some softball activities at this point? Yeah, she's been uh, she's been swinging. Uh, she's still not quite ready to play in the outfield, but. Uh... She's been swinging live, swinging well, and um, yeah, so it's just uh, day by day with her, but it's uh, it's good to see her swinging again, you know. Uh, she's gone through a lot the past couple of years, and uh, you know, you really cool for a kid like that. Yeah, we, we talked about this with Olivia Latin and she went through, but is it one of the more rewarding things as a coach when you see a player go down and then come back and succeed after months and months of grueling rehab from an injury? Sure, it just uh, it just speaks to their their character, tenacity, and those kind of things. Uh, easy to throw in the towel when uh, when the injury bug comes in, you know. I'm, I'm done, but um, Kaden's battled through it and uh, lived battled through it, and uh, yeah, just uh, just tough kid. So here's a question I've been really looking forward to asking you because following along with the great work that Sean Torney does for Hokey Softball and Social, and then the work that you do on your Twitter feed. Coach, it feels like there's a lot of really neat technology used in practice. I think you actually tweeted a couple of weeks ago that the coaches want to stay here longer because you guys were enjoying the technology. What kind of technology are you guys using during the fall, and how does that help your team get better? Yeah, there's a lot a lot of stuff going on. Um, we use motion capture. We use a um, new thing called Yacker Tech, which measures spin rate of uh, the pitchers and spin direction. Uh, I think the biggest one was uh, the hit tracks. So hit tracks is kind of like a simulator uh, on our field that uh, if you hit, you look at the TV and see if it got caught or the fielders. The hit tracks defense is really, really good. I think uh, the players would say that it's unfair, but uh, you know, it's it's just um, the hit tracks was one of those things where we went through so much, the players did this summer. And it's kind of a reward just for sticking it out, you know, and um, they, they love it so far. And uh, they're in here hitting all the time. So technology is a, is, is a big deal. And like I said, I probably said this in podcasts before, but it's not the end all be all. You know, you got this competition aspect to, to playing and there's human elements and all that kind of stuff. So you can data all you want, but, uh, um, you know, you still got to go out there and play. Sure. Um... All right, let's transition now talk about your staff a little bit. We actually had our first guest on the Hokie Softball Podcast. Last episode, uh, assistant coach Michael Lewis joining us. Coach, you hire him from the University of Minnesota. You guys played the Gophers last year. Of course, a program that's had a lot of success the last couple of years in the Big Ten. What stood out to you about Coach Lewis when you hired him, and how has he fit into the culture so far in the fall? Yeah, well, the first thing that stands out with Mike is uh... – He's just a good dude, you know. He, he he works hard. He's respectful. He gets along with people. Um, he's just he's just pleasant to be around, you know. So that's that's one. Uh, his playing experience was another thing that stood out to me. And you know, there's there's things there's just because because you say you play men's fast pitch softball doesn't mean there's there's different levels of it, you know. So for me, I, I didn't play at a level of Doug or Mike, you know? So I don't have the experience of picking an Adam Folkard who throws 85 miles an hour. Mike does, you know? So that's a big deal for me. He plays at the highest level. It's not like, you know, I didn't play at the lowest, but I didn't play at the highest either, you know? So uh, Mike has, he's got experience for, you know, shoot, I think he's played in eight ISCs, which is the highest level you can play. And he won uh, the ASA major, which is the highest level you can play in ASA. So. USA softball now so um that was that was a big deal so his his playing experience he brings another set of eyes to us 
and um, experience uh, as far as playing. And he can throw really plus BP, which is another thing that uh, you know I, I don't want to I don't want to put shoulder the burden on Coach Gillis as much anymore. Um, you know, I'd like to, to hit live a little bit more and, and you know, I don't, I don't want Doug throwing out there all the time. He's got other other responsibilities. So Mike can do, um, he's a good dude, he's experienced and can throw high, high level. That was going to be one of my follow-up questions. Who do you think is going to throw better BP? Can we get early indications of Coach Gillis or Coach Lewis? I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I'm sure they both have different strengths. Mike's in shape and Doug's not. So how about that? No, no, no. Is it? Like I said, it's it's when, Doug hasn't thrown much yet, you know. So I'm, I'm easing him into it. Um, Mike's ready to throw right now. Hasn't thrown all out yet, but uh, we don't need him to at the moment. So um, it's going to be nice to have two pitchers throw that are probably better than the majority of the pitchers that we see. So if you're going in here, Mike's throwing, you know, 68 to 72, and you know we don't see that very often. You just don't see the ball move up at 68 very often. And there's obviously upper upper tier players are doing that, but uh, yeah, it just it's just good. It, it it's going to be beneficial for our hitters. So thinking about you know, programs around the country, this is something you can probably allude to. But I feel like having that the benefit of this program, I don't know if other programs around the country have that benefit of two uh, elite coaches who can throw like that in BP. Is that fair to say? I think so. I mean, I I, I can't think of any. You know, I, I can't think of, you know, you might have one one thrower that can really get it, um, but I don't know about upper 60s. Um, and, and, you know, Doug's rise ball at 62 is probably spins better than 99% of the kids that we're going to see. So, um, you know, we're probably uh, a landmark program because all four of us played men's fast pitch at one time or another. So I'm not saying that's going to make us an All-American or uh, Olympic or uh, a World Series team. <laughs> But uh, we'll take the Olympics too, if you'd like, Coach. Yeah, Olympics, whatever. Uh, no, I'm not qualified for that. But uh, yeah, so it's it's not. I'm not saying because we're all ex former men's players or current that we're any better than anybody else. It's just a different different perspective, and uh, I think we're unique in that way. So what a summer it was for Coach Lewis, right? He gets hired, but then he's also playing, uh, you know, men's fast pitch on the highest level. His team wins the national title. Right. What was that like to watch him go out there and not just win the national title coach, had a walk-off two-run single in the semis, had a home run in his first at-bat. I mean, really was one of the best players. He was named an All-American in right. that tournament. What was it like watching him go out there and compete? I think the more fair question was like, what it was it like for him to play with when all eyes were on him? <laughs> you know? No, he, he, he did awesome. He, he – uh, the, the, the beneficial thing for us as a program, besides Mike getting experience and winning, was the amount of people that actually watched him play. So uh, the exposure of the men's game and our program was pretty big because you know I had kids call me all the time, hey, what positions Coach Lewis? I'm watching, you know, and it's like plays well, third base. Oh, cool, I'm watching. And and a recruit said that and. Uh, just a lot of people and you know, travel coaches and uh, just the exposure for him playing was beneficial for our program. No question. Um, but there's a lot of times, you know, the Timbuktu Church League men's men's league is not being broadcast. You know, but the ISC they broadcast and and the ASA now. Um, it's just people can be exposed to the highest level of, of the game on the men's side. Coach, I would love to get your uh, expertise on this question. Peter. You know, the games are so similar between what you're coaching at Virginia Tech and, and college softball. You know, wh what can the players who are watching, your 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 players take away from watching the men's fast pitch tournaments at the highest levels? Anything you can take away? Anything that really relates? Yeah, I think it all relates. But the speed of the game is faster. There's no question, you know. And so there's a lot of – conservation of energy, conserving energy, um, let's just say chopper to the shortstop and the runner is, is a below average runner. The shortstop just lobs it over to first, where a lot of times you see uh, some of our players, they take it and just throw bullets to first. You get them out by 40 feet, well, so what? 
So there's a lot of con uh, conserving of energy there. Um, just obviously the game is a little bit faster. So, um, but yeah, just being able to watch that is uh, just, it's just, it just makes you better. Well, it's like a major league baseball game, you know? And, and it took me a while when I coached to watch it as a coach and watch baseball as a coach and not as a fan. You know, as a fan, you're following the ball. As a coach, you're you're following other things. So when I go to, if I see a game live, I went to a White Sox game live last year, and I you don't watch the pitcher hitter, which you typically do as a fan. You're watching, I'm watching the shortstop and the pre-pitch movement, and do they hop, do they step, you know, just stuff like that, and uh, arm angles and, and those kind of things. And I think the more you watch the game as a, as a, as a coach and not a player, it makes you better. Coach, when I watch playoff baseball over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to try and watch it through your lens and uh, do just yeah. that. And, and, and it, it goes, it, it's as far as, you know, let's see a 2-0, a 2 pitch that when you watch your next game, 2-0 pitch to whoever your favorite hitter. And they're not on time. They don't swing. 2-0 pitch, you're, you're swinging so hard that you need a chiropractor when you finish, you know, finish your swing. You know, and so that's the kind of things you need to look at. How do they take pitches? You know, there's so much more than just following the ball around. You know, especially in, in, in bat and ball sports. Well, that got great exposure, as you said, for your program. Another thing that got great exposure to the program was another one of your coaches on staff. And Coach Sammy Faye, of course, a yeah. player in her time, uh, was a captain of a team in the Athletes Unlimited League. And this was a league we were talking before we went on the air. This got a lot of exposure uh, across the ESPN networks. So what was that experience like for Sammy to be the captain? And what kind of exposure did that bring for the Hokie softball program? It, it was great exposure for, for us and, and the game in general. You know, it's just, uh, I, I like the format. It's almost like you're a free agent every game. And uh, yeah, I think it's just uh, when, when a league can separate and do things a little bit different than uh, other leagues do, I think it, it creates a buzz. And I, I think Athletes in Unlimited did that. And uh, it was just fun to watch her play. I know our players followed her a, a little bit. Um, for me, personally, I, I, I knew you know four or five girls in that league, uh, ladies, um, that I coached. So uh, it's just fun to follow them and uh, you know look at their stats and see what they did and where they were ranked and all that kind of stuff. So. It was, uh, it was good exposure for us, and it was good exposure for um, for the game in general. And, of course, her younger sister now, a freshman on the team. And, you know, the Fagans, one of the more recognizable name in all of softball the last couple of years. So I think it's a kind of a great transition, honestly, to talk about her. She's been here a couple of years now in the program. What does Coach Fagan provide for this Virginia Tech softball team? Uh, she's close enough to the players' ages that she relates really well to them. You know, and, and the thing with Sammy, I don't know that there's been, I mean, she's one of the hardest workers that I've ever coached, ever. You know, and I say, you know, we have something, and I said this in a, in a group meet last week, um, when DeChambeau, he won the um, US Open. And, but on Saturday night, he gets done, he's, he's getting off the course and he goes and hits drives for another hour. There's, there's something different with players um, work ethics and just doing what you need to do in practice a lot of time isn't enough there has to be more and I don't know I mean there's there's a couple players that I've coached that I mean they're they're like cage rats you know in the most respectful way um and Sammy was one of those you know she was she was there an hour early before practice and um every day and um so her experience and just uh, she's done it, you know. So I think she brings that to our program and just a kind of a, just another another ear for the girls. Great summer for Hokie softball again, headlined by Coach Lewis being hired to your staff, and then Coach Fagan doing what she did, and then of course Coach Lewis winning the national championship. Good good summer and a good start to the fall. We're nearly a half hour into the Hokie softball podcast, Coach. You know what that time. It's time. Story time. It's story time with Uncle Pete. If you're a first okay. time or, or listener, uh, this started uh, really into when we first started doing Hokie Softball Podcast, just giving a topic 
We'll go down whatever path uh, it might entail. You know, really, when I prep for these, sometimes it's fun questions, but I love when I'm able to go through your Twitter coach, which, folks, I highly recommend. It is a great follow at VT Softball Coach. Go give it a follow. Um, But we've got to start. I want to spend some time talking about daily art posts, (laughs) which has been going on on your Twitter for about the last month or so. And, and, And these are just pictures of Coach Gillis either in action, he might be sleeping on the couch. Uh, tell us, what what started this daily art post on your Twitter account? Well, I gotta preface this by saying uh, art was Doug's dad. Doug's dad was a, uh, a fast-pitched lifer, just absolutely loved the game, really smart. I met him a couple times, just, uh, just, just a softball guy, you know, a softball man. And uh, daily art is, um, Art Senior could get a little uh, grumpy at times, and um, Art Junior can get a little grumpy at times. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's hilarious how many people are, reach out to me saying, um, we need more content of art. And I thought, all right, you ask and you shall receive. So it's just uh, it's just a funny, funny thing I started, and uh, I think people like it. Um, Sometimes people and coaches especially can take the social media a little bit too to extremes. Uh, that's not that's not what we are. So uh, the daily art just kind of lightens things up and uh, you know good for a couple laughs. And even if people don't laugh, rest assured I am laughing when I'm taking those pictures. And first he, he has no idea that I'm doing it. So you know I snipe him. And, you know he's sitting there and. I'll hide the phone and get a picture of him. And then I'll start laughing and he'll go, hey, what'd you do? So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's good. I think my favorite picture might've been him in a cowboy hat. That was one uh, that's for the record books. Yeah, my, my old boss at, uh, at Kennesaw, his name is Scott Whitlock, coaching uh, legend there. And he was our associate AD and he wore the cowboy hat all the time. And I, I took it and made Doug get it or put it on and took the picture. And, yeah, rest is history. So a couple other daily art posts I want to ask you about when he was talking about the screw and peel fastball. Yeah. What was that conversation like? Because I've never heard of a screw and peel fastball. Yeah, he was, uh, yeah. I don't know. We just, <laughs> Mike, and that's another great thing about Mike is he likes to push Doug's buttons just, just as much as I do. So we don't really throw peel fastball through whatever so we just ask uh, Doug about his opinion of it and he just goes on a, on a tangent so we say just fill him up with a quarter and uh, he'll spit out all the information that you want to hear so that was one of those uh, hey just fill him up with a quarter and um, let's see what he's got to say I think coach Lewis actually responded with a gif of DeWitt's fruit getting a snack out and just filling the quarters into the yeah that's it that's it and, and that's <laughs> that's it's I hope that people get the idea that it's not just shenanigans at in, at Virginia Tech. We like to have fun off the field. On the field, we're, we don't see anything because we're we're taking care of business. So there's a difference. There's a difference there. So, um, but off the off the field, all, all bets are off. All right. So our one true story time. This is something I couldn't really prep for all this much because it all depends on you, Coach. Uh, is going through these daily art coach there was actually a coach who tweeted at you and you talked about early in your coaching career when you were doing lessons somebody told you about a fuzzball can coach gillis throw a fuzzball a and b what is a fuzzball oh my god uh um i was given lessons had to be 2007 or 8 and that dad, he came right up to me, straight faced me, and said, um, "Can you teach my daughter the fuzzball?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "No, don't know what you're talking about, man." I, I said, "Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't even remember what I said, but uh, yeah, I, I know. I was just starting to know Doug then, and I think I asked him. He's like, "That's not, that's not possible. There's, there's no way this guy passed." And I said, I'm "Telling you, man, he asked me about a fuzzball." And so uh, I don't know if it was, you know, put some belly button lint on a, on a ball and throw a drop. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it was hilarious. I, 
it makes me laugh to this day that somebody asked me that. I didn't dream it. I know I, you know, I, I asked him three times. What? What? <laughs> and in the tweet that you put out about the story, is where I'm getting information from. Apparently, that person told you that they're teaching it in Oklahoma City. Is that true? No, I can't. No, I, he had to be in on the joke. I, I don't. I don't remember who who put that on there. I have to go back and look. But uh, there's no way. There's no. There's no way. Like there's a lot of pitches being made up, but you can't call something the fuzzball. There's, there's, there's no. No, can't happen. Listen, if there is a pitch called the fuzzball, I put full faith in Coach Gillis figuring out how to throw it and the throw, how to throw it well. So, if there's a fuzzball and you're listening, email me. I want to take a look at it. How about this? If there's a fuzzball and it's real, we'll have you on as a guest on the Hokie Softball Podcast. Sure. Uh, yeah, we do a little demonstration. So, yeah. Um, all right, a couple more fun questions here. Uh, story time with Uncle Pete, Hokie Softball Podcast. Uh, Quickly, you know, again, let's stay on the theme of Coach Gillis uh, because the last time we talked, you said that he bought what he called a new pair of clubs, which you said were like 1980s, 1990s with the clubs. How yeah. have you looked on the golf course? How have you looked on the golf course since the last time we chatted? Uh, so we'll start with Doug. Um, yeah, he bought he bought some that were like 1984 and um, hitting pretty good with them and. He has since been down to Winston-Salem twice. Evidently, the PGA Superstore is down there or whatever. And he went down about six weeks ago and spent a bunch of money to get irons, get fitted. And uh, they finally came in. So I don't know. I think they're Japanese. They came from Japan or something. And uh, spent a boatload of money on them. So he should be ready for the senior tour soon. But uh, my game about a month and a half ago was, was stellar. And I actually started taking a, uh, um, a handicap again. So I started, you know, looking, started recording my handicap and uh, I was down to probably a seven, which is pretty good for me. And uh, I've since gone up, trending up. So uh, not down, down is good, up is, is not good. Um, I played last weekend and uh, played pretty well, but I doubled 16, 17, and 18 for an 85, so um, back to normal. There you go. All right, last one, Coach. I yep. got a really good chuckle out of this on your Twitter, um, and I think the, the players are watching, which I have heard some – there are some players on the roster who really do enjoy the Hokie Softball podcast, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I think that we will all laugh about this. Uh, this was a tweet of yours on September 24th, quote, I just found out that the kids these days are calling songs bangers, showing yeah. age, close quote. So, Coach, I'm glad I'm someone who refers to, like, hit songs as bangers myself. So you're, you've are you got the lingo now. You're all, you're all good. Man, no, I don't. <laughs> no, it, some, some uh, player told me, you know, it's a banger. Bieber's new song is a banger. And I said, what does that mean? I, I had no idea. She said it. Only bangers are the really good ones, and that's okay. But uh, there's way more lingo. I think um, herd is one. Herd. Okay, I, I just learned that one. But I mean, the all-time my, my favorite is the uh, the skull emoji. <laughs> Gotta be. <laughs> After like, someone, you know, a joke or something, throw the skeleton emoji in. Yeah, you know? yeah. I'm I'm down on I'm down with that that one. Herd and banger, all that stuff, man. Nah. I can't, I can't get down with that. But the skull emoji, I'm, I'm good with. Okay. Well, hey, real quick, what kind of bangers have we been playing during practice in the indoor so far? I mean, we still have um, Money Mondays. Any, any yeah. playlist? Eddie's still around. Eddie's still around. Uh, we had a George Strait day so far, and um, I think today's was uh, '90s alternative. So, um, so far, so good. <laughs> Here we have it. Listen, we have talked about uh, Bryson DeChambeau, who we mentioned on this podcast. We've talked about daily art posts of fuzzball, uh, national championships. I think that this has been one of the most successful Hokie softball podcasts that we've done. Evan, it speaks to your true professionalism because you got fuzzball into the podcast. Nobody better. Might as well just say kick and chicken classic just to get it in. Oh, there. Yeah, yeah. That's an old, that's, that's a good one. So bring that back for the new year, the Hokie Softball. Retro. Well, the first one of the new year, Coach, I'm fired up. I'm ready for more of these. I, I know on behalf of everybody watching and listening, you know, we always 
Appreciate your time. And we look forward to hearing more stories about Coach Gillis, Coach Lewis, the squad. Um, hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. And we look forward to many more. Sounds good. All right, well, that'll do it for this edition of the Hokie Softball Podcast. Our thanks to Sean Torney, the SID for softball, for setting it up and all he does. And, of course, the coach of the Hokies, Coach DeMore, for his time. My name is Evan Hughes saying so long. Thanks so much for watching. We'll talk to you next time on the next edition of the Hokie Softball Podcast.